Uh, this is Brian Fenn. This is the last session of the day, so I appreciate you sticking with it. So, among the courses and workshops and everything that I've taught over the years, uh, one sort of overarching theme is that I'm really passionate about web accessibility, accessibility in general, really. Uh, so, I don't remember this, and I don't know what keeps happening in those images, but uh, mm -hmm. I am a doctor developer over at Detroit Labs. I lead the girl development chapter here in Detroit. And. Apparently, you unplug one, they don't. It's a mess of both. So. Um, We're just going to leave this one alone. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're going to. Just to let me know, at any point, if you can't see anything. Thank you. 
something like we talk to someone else who works in it, or someone who is just learning about it and asks us a question on there. Wow, I hadn't thought about that. Yes, and that is an excellent point, which I will get to later, about how teaching things can uh, help you to learn. So the way that I think about accessibility is very similar. It is the process of making it easy for everyone to access your content, regardless of how they approach the web. So whether I am blind or visually impaired, or whether I am missing a hand, or whether I can't hear very well, whether my hands shake, um, maybe I don't, uh, maybe I don't read well, maybe that's uh, due to a uh, language uh, issue, and, you know, I'm, reading, I'm trying to read something in English, maybe it's because I have dyslexia, it could be any number of things. Uh, there are barriers between your users uh, and your content. Many of your users and your content, and our, and our goal, our job, a huge part of our job is to start to break down those barriers. So why do we need it? We've talked sort of about this already. Why is this important? Why are you here? I'm sure some of you have reasons to be here. Everyone should have access. It's not just limited to sighted or hearing people or people with pain. It should be everybody should have access. It's the World Wide Web for God's sakes. <laughs> yes, I feel like that. <laughs> When, uh, when you say to your employer or you say to your client, hey, we really need to be doing this. Uh, we really need to be making sure that our apps, our websites, are accessible as accessible as we can make them. The uh, first thing that you're going to hear is, well, how much is that going to cost? Uh, and in reality, it should be that this is part of your process. You're doing it anyway. It isn't an extra thing that you layer on top. This is just how we build. Um, but in a lot of cases, you know, maybe you're coming on to a project where that wasn't a priority. Maybe you haven't just inherited this inaccessible code. Or it could be that you just didn't know, and that's okay. Um, but what's important is that you start doing what you can now uh, to start making your apps and your websites more accessible. Uh, and a huge Huge part of this is that about one fifth, about twenty percent of users are going to have some form of disability, some something, and it's not necessarily uh, a form of blindness. I know that's more that later. Um, something that is putting up one of those barriers, something that is making it harder for them than the average person to access your content, and so having access to all of those people. Uh, making it so that they can use your product easily and quickly, the same way that you or I would, uh, means that you have more users, which is almost always a good thing. Uh, and then, we kind of hit on this already, like, that's just what you should do. It's, it makes uh, life better for everyone. It makes your app better for everyone. Um, Hodge, in the diversity panel earlier, uh, used the example of a bathroom stall. Uh, you have a bigger bathroom stall with railing uh, for people who are wheelchair bound. So, but that's the most desirable bathroom stall. Is it not? It's the queens. It's the biggest. I can move around. I don't have to feel like I'm like trying really hard not to touch anything. Like, it's just better. Uh, and so, making our apps. In the, in the same way, making our apps better for people with disabilities just makes them better. Uh, and I love your point, like, it is the World Wide Web. The point of it is that we are sharing information, uh, and we want to be able to share that information with everyone. Cool. So, if, again, if you're in the diversity panel, we kind of touched on this, but I want to start to dive into standards that we uh, that all of this is really based on. Um, there are other there are other standards that uh, 
you may want to read up on depending in some cases depending on the industry uh, and uh, especially if you are working on gaming mobile there are additional guidelines uh, that we can talk about if that is a question that comes up but we're going to start with this CAG 2.0, that is the <laughs> Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. I wasn't sure I was going to remember it. Uh, web Content Accessibility Guidelines, do you better know? Uh, so these are a set of guidelines that are broken up into four principles. Uh, your site or app should be perceivable, it should be operable, understandable, and robust. Uh, and those are further broken down into 12 guidelines. Uh, so the guidelines are where you are kind of seeing the more, starting to see the more measurable goals here. And we'll, I'll take you through a sort of checklist uh, in just a moment. So your guidelines are going to be, okay, you need, a, you need to have alternative tests. Uh, what does that mean? And then further down, we're going to break that out into success criteria. So we know that we need alternative tests for non-text content. What does that mean? And how do we test it? Uh, so we're actually going to pop back over here to my only desktop that doesn't have a million things on it. <laughs> and we're going to uh, look at the uh, okay, guidelines. If you know the medicine network will let us. Uh, so while we're while I'm floating, we're going to talk about these levels. Uh, so your six criteria are going to have a level A, a level A, a level A attached to them. That is uh, that is an indication of largely the impact that, that that meeting that success criteria will have on the accessibility of your app. Um, people tend to think of these as being exactly sequential, which is not the case. Uh, Level, you're not necessarily going to have a level triple A uh, success criteria um, related to a particular event. Uh, so what we what we want to make sure that we're doing uh, in an ideal <coughs> time is at the very least you're meeting the level A criteria and on the level double A criteria. If there are level, triple A criteria that are that are relevant to the app that you're making, and they might not all be. They are, the goal should be uh, to meet those level AAA criteria as well. There's no internet connection. <laughs> because it's trying to it's trying to connect to activity. Why I don't know. I've forgotten it as many times as it's come up. It's my that's this is my life today. Um and it's, we are going to pull up. We are going to pull up a quick reference for you. There we go. So this reference uh, is <laughs> essentially what I use to help people kind of start to feel more comfortable with the guidelines. Um, if you just try to read them all at once, then you, you get overwhelmed. So it's too much. Uh, and it's very, it's very specific, very technical, um, and dry. It's, it's just dry. I, I admit that. I, I literally wrote a course on this, and I had to take it in chunks. It was too much. Uh, but this tool is really cool uh, because it lets you sort of interact with the guidelines and only see the parts that are relevant to you. So, if you're on a team, then you can say, okay, we have this type of content, we're making this kind of app, uh, and we can use these filters over on the left-hand side to do that. Uh, you might say, I only want to see the guidelines that are relevant to the designers. You might say, I, want to, I only want to see the ones that are relevant to the developers. And so you can filter that way. Uh, and then this uh, section on the right then is only the guidelines that you need to worry about in that moment. Uh, and you can share this uh, among your team, which makes it really easy to kind of stay aligned on what you're working on. Uh, so let's break this down real quick. Uh, the first, so the first uh, pillar, 
first principle over here is perceivable. Your app, your content needs to be perceivable. And the first guideline here is text alternatives. Guide, guideline 1.1 text alternatives. Uh, we need to provide text alternatives for any non-text content so that it can be changed into other forms that people need, such as large print, braille, speech symbols, or simpler language. So if you have Sorry, there's someone else still downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Very strange. Oh. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. 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 So for this, we just have one success criteria, uh, non text content. 1.1.1, one, 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 right at the beginning, and that's level A, that's baseline, that is like the low hanging fruit, that's that single A. Uh, all non text content that is presented to the user has a text alternative. Um, now, note, this is except for the situations listed below. A number of these are going to have exceptions. There are going to be cases where it doesn't make sense for you to provide a text alternative. For example, if I have an image that is purely decorative, there is, I don't need to say that there is like a flowery, scrolly thing in the corner of my web page. I don't personally, I don't probably want to put it there in the first place. It's yeah. not um, relevant. Um, but do pay attention to uh, those exceptions when they come up. Any questions so far? We're about 18 minutes ago. Could you please click on one of those show full description? Oh, show one point one. Just curious. Yeah. Okay. So this will break it down for you. This is what I really like. It's not all thrown at you at once. Uh, you can say, okay, I know that one, I can, I can do this, or you can say, show full description, and you can see kind of the, uh, the examples that they get. And you can also then show techniques and failures for that specific success criteria. Um, and it'll give you all kinds of examples. And situations. So, um, in this case, the situation B. If short description cannot serve the same purpose and present the same information as a non text content. Um, so this is if you if you have a chart or a diagram or something like that. Um, this is how you would go about providing that textual uh, alternative. So this is what I uh, is, is there um, some sort of emulator for screen reader? Like, how so, do I know what the line person is? That's an excellent question. And you're going to talk about it. Uh, we can talk about it now. You can just use the screen reader. Um, so, uh, a bunch of the more popular ones are like, uh, you can just use them out of the box on, the, on any Apple product. Oh, okay. um, yeah. Like, like, Windows or uh, does the Windows have one built in? So the problem with the browser or the operating system? Yeah. And you can just start when you got a little bit of turn on the Okay. Oh, no. I'm like, so I'm telling you this from the perspective of a teacher. Like, if you have questions, please stop me. If have something to add, please tell me. Okay, I know a thing. I'm totally open to that. It's all good. So, yes, you can absolutely use the screen reader and um, uh, if we have time later on, we can shoot that. Anything else before we move on? Okay. So, this is just uh, 
Uh, this is pulled from uh, this. So if you want, just FYI, if any of you are working on court, have any of you ever contributed to WordPress core? I see a couple knots, that's cool. Uh, if you haven't, that's cool too. Um, but no, so I was I found this kind of interesting. The way that this is worded implies that we are either skipping uh, level A, we don't need to worry about those, or uh, that the or that it is obvious that uh, level double A includes it. Um, just again, know that that's not always the case. They're not. They're not. They don't quite work that way. Uh, level double A is not necessarily more than an equivalent level A criteria. Right Let's talk about the basics here. Um, <laughs> this is like a typical image that you might find. Um, on any sort of exercise related website. Right? Um, but I, if I'm coming at this with a screen view, if I'm um, using my keyboard and navigator, I might not know what this says, unless, and we've already touched on this, I have some alternative text. So, <laughs> so uh, these, these are, and this is where my questions for you get started. So, do all of your images have all that that is a simple, easy thing that you can do. Every time you create an image, every time you add an image to your app or your website, you add this alt attribute and give a brief description. Uh, you do not need to write a paragraph about the image. Mine says, happy woman exercising. And that's probably fine. Nobody needs to know, unless it is relevant to your content, Nobody needs to know what she looks like. They don't need to know what kind of room she's in. Uh, unless you are describing your gym, uh, then by all means, I'm going to put that in a paragraph somewhere. Uh, but <laughs> unless it is relevant to your content, you don't need to get uh, too, too deep into the description. Just make sure that it's clear what that image is there and why it's there. Honestly, for me, the biggest, this is probably the biggest thing. So manage the markup. Um, make sure that your markup reflects the hierarchical structure of the page. And by that I mean, especially if you're kind of, I think it was, um, one of the organizers uh, phrased it really well. It said, unless, when you're, especially if you're really trying to push the envelope in terms of design, uh, this is where you want to pay attention. It's a tendency, at least in my experience, is to sort of fudge the, the information architecture of your app when you're trying to do something fancy in terms of design. And that can really hurt the accessibility of your application. Uh, you want to make sure that you're using all of the tags that make sense in the context of your app. So if you uh, if you've got a header, use a header element. Uh, if you have uh, a button, use a button element. It's, it sounds so simple, but in a production application, it's, it's shocking to me how many you see that don't do these things, that don't you make use of the semantic markup that we have available to us. Uh, and that can be a huge step in our direction in terms of Another super simple thing. Make sure that your color, that your colors, uh, especially when you're talking about text, uh, contrast enough. And uh, that's where the success criteria comes in. This is an absolutely measurable thing. Uh, you can run it through a checker, you can uh, run an audit and talk about those tools, uh, and you'll know. It's not something you have to guess at. And then descriptive content. So this is where we get more towards the marketing, more towards the copywriting side of things. Uh, do, does, um, does your content sort of speak for itself? Is your, uh, are your titles descriptive? Do they display um, what the following content is about? Or are you getting kind of 
Uh, or are they catchy? You know, are you trying to grab someone's attention but not really telling them what's coming next? Uh, and my my personal pet peeve here: don't click here buttons um, or links. When you uh, when you use a link, your uh, the text that you're surrounding in those link tags is what's going to be read to the person using a screen reader and I'm getting their keyboard. Uh, so if I hear link, click here, it's not going to tell me anything about what happens when I click there. Uh, and I want to know before I start clicking things randomly. Cool. So uh, we'll work through some uh, practical application. Uh, one thing that we haven't exactly talked about is uh, adding in some padding around your clickable elements. Uh, this is great for a number of reasons. So one, all the stuff that you're making is responsive, right? Yeah? I'm seeing a lot of blank stares, so I'm hoping the answer is yes. Yeah, responsive. All right, yes. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't know what that means, uh, then I'm glad you're here. Uh, responsive websites and applications just mean that we are able to take the same code base uh, and it's going to respond to the size of the device it's being used on, right? So I can look at my slides, hopefully, I've never actually tried this. Hopefully I can look at my slides on my phone or my iPad or whatever, and they will look reasonably okay. Um, uh, certainly, if I'm looking at a site that I've spent any amount of time building, it's going to look great on either an app, or on either a, a mobile phone, a tablet, uh, or any size of laptop I have. It's going to be the same experience. It's going to be equivalent to the experience that I would get on any other device, uh, which is also what we want in terms of accessibility. Uh, and so in this case, this is uh, increasing the pattern around your clinical elements is going to be great one for anybody who's using it on a mobile device. So I personally have very large fingers. And I want to be able to click on the things I want to click on and not the thing next to the thing I want to click on. Uh, having a little bit of pattern around that makes that much, much easier. So you can see here, this is a link. Uh, but that gray area, that darker gray area, is the clickable area. And so beyond the link itself, I can see, <laughs> uh, I can see that I'm able to click uh, or, or tap, as the case may be. This is also good uh, if you have users who uh, lack uh, motor. So if I have a little bit of a tremor, the bigger the clickable area, the less sort of uh, the, the greater my margin of error, I can I can miss and still hit when I'm going for it. You also want to make sure that your user can navigate your entire application using the key. And that's something that you can accomplish in the manual testing to make sure that that is the case. So I should be able to tab through and hit every interactive element of your page. Uh, I should be able to use my screen reader and get to everything. <laughs> so, yeah, if I'm, uh, again, if I'm using the keyboard, does the focus, uh, does the focus shift uh, when I have dynamic elements? So if there's a pop-up on your application, um, is the screen reader going to know that there's a pop-up in there? And is it going to start reading in there? Uh, is the keyboard going to get access to that pop-up? The answer should be yes in both cases. Uh, and that's just one example. And captions are another. Uh, so if you have any video content, making sure that <laughs> this is very meta. This is a video about making captions on YouTube. Um, <laughs> Uh, if you have to do a comment, making sure that you have captions, making sure that the captions are accurate. And there are a number of ways you can do that, including just paying someone to do that. Um, so quickly, I want to consider some other challenges we've kind of touched on. Um, the first is um, motor 
more difficulty. So if I've got a charm, if I'm or if I'm missing a hand or both hands, um, <clears throat> there are a number of assistive technologies uh, that people can use to to continue to access the web. Right? And we want to make sure that we are accounting for those, not just about minors. That's really what I'm, what I'm trying to drive home here. There are also cognitive uh, difficulties that put up some of those barriers. Is your user dyslexic? Uh, do they have other do they have other learning disabilities? Uh, is a lot of moving content or spinning, uh, or spinning objects is that going to distract from the content? Probably, even if they don't have those sort of cognitive difficulties. Like that's probably distracting anyone. Uh, and there are, uh, again, standards to help you gauge that. And again, here, uh, are you making sure that there is textual, um, there are textual alternatives to your audio content? Uh, and in terms of testing, there are a number of tools that we're going to kind of talk through that will, that we're going to touch on rather that uh, are obvious. To run them, uh, run an audit, and see what's going on with your site. That can fix it. But I think it's also really important to do manual testing as well. Ideally, with users with some of these disabilities, um, you can again that's something that you can hire out. That's something that you can uh, solicit. And uh, it's something. It's also something you can do yourself. You can learn to use a screen reader. And work through your app on a regular basis. Uh, work with your work with your QA if you have one uh, to learn how to do that. Uh, or even with uh, a bunch of people at Labs who are you know, uh, working on making sure that everything works well with switch controls, uh, which is really really cool. Please talk to me about that. We can totally talk to you. <laughs> Uh, so there may be some tools that you can use. Uh, Web AM color contrast checker, super easy. If you've already got colors that you want to make sure are cool, run through here and it will tell you whether you need the double A or the triple A or both. Uh, in this case, they actually do have a uh, So the triple A is a little more uh, strict. Uh, color safe, if you're just kind of exploring and uh, maybe you're building something new, this uh, with this tool you can Color and then choose uh, your foreground color, and all of the options it gives you will be compliant um, based on the uh, confrontation. Uh, so there is actually an NPM module. So if you're working in JavaScript, uh, you have uh, an NPM or another project. You can use this to automatically audit your sites, and you can run it against your app while it's in development. And just keep checking and making sure, just along with all your other tests. Uh, and last, uh, we have Apps, which is a tool for Fire Q. Um, and we'll, I highly recommend checking out a lot of their stuff. Um, they do they put out a lot of content on a lot, they do a lot of training. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more, uh, not only is this a great tool, uh, but you can learn a ton from their products as well. So, your homework for today, find one thing that you can do out of all of the things that we've talked about to, from now on, one small thing that you can do to make your apps, your work, more accessible. There's some resources here for you. Uh, please feel free to ask me about these after. Um, I will be giving uh, a link to the slides to the organizers so that you can follow up with this. Uh, and we have time. Yeah, we have time. Oh, cool. Time for people to Awesome. Any questions? Yes. So one of my favorite tricks is to use, instead of using an image, I use it as an image background. That way I don't have to force constraints on my um, on people uploading the images. Is that bad for accessibility? Should I add an alt tag if I'm doing something like that still? So, yes. If you were, so, you are putting the image, you're using the image as a background, but it is, it is itself like... So it would be a div or something, and I'll use it as a background image, rather than having the actual image there, that way I can set it to 
always cover the open space that it is, rather than sticking to specific what the image ratio is. Okay, I would maybe use CSS for that, um, and yes, include an alternative text if you must. Um, you can. So one technique is to have like a screen reader only class that you then apply to the text that describes it. Um, but yeah, in that case, I would probably still just use the image tag with all text personally. Oh yes. Um, so you know, so that it's, it's clear, like you um, that way you're, you know your your markable file date and everything. Um, but like if it's only do that if you really truly really don't uh, want to include that as as content. You don't need for it to be like a meaningful piece of thing. Usually, that image isn't providing me as she said, meaningful information. It could be just a, a curly cue that you put a little more of some sort of background element, element, but it's not adding value in any way. It's called the all the text. That's suitable. There's never missing all the text, but it can be empty. So, the other thing I wanted to add is plain language can make your content so much more usable. And we are accustomed to using acronyms and whatever we do, whatever business we're involved in. But those acronyms are known to the people who are coming to your page. You may have explained the acronym on your home page, but they come to your about page and you're using uh, PhD acronym that they have no idea what that is. So whenever you use it on your pages, explain it on your students. And also use plain language that makes it easier for people to understand. And a good example of that not happening often is academia and research pages that can be really difficult and obtuse to read. And as I said, the bag is <laughs> Unfortunately, make it simple for people to read your content. Write short sentences, write short paragraphs, use headings appropriately, and to HTML will get you far. I know in the UK that if you're specifically targeting customers there, your website has to be accessible. Do you know of any other countries that are Pardon? No. That would be the head of your age. Yeah, I'm not doing my hands. Into, um, depending on the, um, sort of industry that you're in. So if you, uh, are doing anything for, like, a government agency, uh, or an educational institution, um, there is, so there's actually, I'm going to have a great, don't worry, 508, it's actually 508. Um, are going to you know, follow those uh, guidelines. <laughs> uh, and that covers more than just all. That's all. That's all of your yeah. materials. Yeah. We're going to do that right now. Yeah. Yeah. All my PowerPoints are to be a DA. The session, by the way, that's asked is following. Okay. So. 